because you are a redeemer. Thank you because you are a savior. Thank you because it has pleased you to redeem us back to yourselves and to give us the privilege of saying, Abba, Father. Father, we thank you. Blessed be your holy name. We hand over the remaining part of this service unto you. Have your way. Glorify yourself. Visit us in special ways in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Let's put our hands together for Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen and amen and amen. Glory to God. Dr. Eko, you're welcome. Glad to have you. Hallelujah. We'll meet him much later. Hallelujah. Let me look at your neighbor and give your neighbor a broad smile. Say, what should your response be? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Let's be seated. Glory to God. Wow, what an awesome time of worship and also a time of praise. Hallelujah. I was almost getting late to come in because I was enjoying the praise and the worship. Hallelujah. We thank God for his faithfulness. Wow. We've been looking at the subject that is um, refusing to end because we believe and trust God that he has so many things to say therein. The subject of activating the force of determination. And um, in the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at the benefits of activating the force of determination. Determination to do what? Determination to pursue the purpose of God for our lives. Determination to pursue the agenda of God. Determination to succeed as he has designed us to be. Determination to do the right thing. <clears throat> Determination to just do what he wants us to do. Hallelujah. And in looking at those benefits, we've examined the fact that the force of determination will release the favor of God and the goodwill of men unto us. And secondly, we said the force of determination to do his will and to fulfill his purpose will distinguish us in our sphere of influence. I pray that the Lord will distinguish you in the name of Jesus as it distinguished Daniel and his three friends who were students of Babylonian Presidential Service Academy. Hallelujah. They were there in that academy for three years and it distinguished Daniel and his three friends. I pray that the Lord will distinguish you in the name of Jesus. We've also looked at Ruth a Moabites, and um, we had a bit of what God is doing through her, and we believe that he's doing through us as well, uh, earlier by the service leader. Hallelujah. We did say that there are four things that happened to Ruth that distinguished, distinguished her from the gleaners. One, she was first invited to lunch with a rich and a prominent man known as Boaz. Uh, secondly, Boaz ordered the servants to make it easy for her. And thirdly, we have said, Boaz not just ordered the servants to make it easy, he also ordered his harvesters to show preference, to show holy partiality. Hallelujah. And I heard Pastor Vincent talk about that. Glory to God. Glory to God. May God instruct men to go out of their way for you. In the name of Jesus. I said, may God instruct people to go out of their way for you. Amen. Boaz also ordered his servants to give us special treatment. Hallelujah. I love that. May God do much more for you. And may he distinguish you from your pack. In the name of Jesus. Today, by the grace of God, we'll be stepping up looking at another benefit of activating the force of determination. Glory to God. And that benefit is in Daniel chapter number one. 
We've been using these two major characters, Daniel and his three friends, and Lady Ruth as a classical example to examine the force of determination. Ruth, in Ruth chapter 1, verse 18, determined to go back with a hopeless Naomi, a hopeless mother-in-law, whereas Daniel and his three friends determined the purpose in their hearts that they will not defile themselves with the delicacies from the king's table. Hallelujah. So, in Daniel chapter 1, we see the result. Let's take for our text, Daniel chapter 1. We'll read verses 18 and 19. Hallelujah. Daniel 1, 18 and 19. We see the results that came true for these young people. Now at the end of the days, when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And what happened? The king interviewed them. Among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they served before the king. Hallelujah. They served before the king. One of the things that causes men to be distinguished is what I call our true put. Our true put is one of the things that causes us to be distinguished. Remember we said... The force activating the force of determination will release the favor of God and the goodwill of men to us. And secondly, it will cause us to be distinguished. One of those things that causes us to be distinguished is our throughput. And when we say throughput, we are talking of our rate of production. Our rate of production. The rate at which a company produces or processes its products or services. That is what is called throughput. In other words, there's so much that you can achieve within a particular time. Throughput, I've defined as the rate at which you succeed at whatever task you are given. Hallelujah. Some tasks are time-bound. And you and I know that time cannot be constrained. Time cannot be stored. It must be used on the go. So, throughput refers to the rate at which you succeed at whatever task you are given per time. Glory to God. Listen. When your throughput is high, either mentally or physically, you become highly productive. It's when your throughput is high that you become highly, you are pronounced as being highly productive. You begin to excel. And the world cannot but notice you. When your throughput is high, the world cannot but notice you. Glory to God. Some of us are given assignments on Monday. By Thursday, they are chasing us. Where is the memo I asked you to write? Just one memo. Where is the reports I need to send to my boss? Since Monday, you are still working at it. You have a very low throughput. Out of laziness, maybe. And some others, they give you an assignment that is expected to take two days. And by the end or the mid of the first day, you have come with the results. Here is the assignment. And your boss is like, did you perform a magic? No. But you know what I'm talking about. Many of you have become, you have caught the civil service mentality. Where something that is to be done in one hour, you use four days to do it. True put. Hallelujah. When your throughput is high, either mentally or physically, you become highly productive. You begin to excel, and the world cannot but notice you. Hallelujah. The world will take notice of you. On your sphere of influence, the world will take notice of you. In your career, the world will take notice of you. In the name of Jesus. And when that begins to happen, I can assure you that you become a candidate for enlistment in the king's service. The king's service is not for layabouts. It is not for those with very low productivity. No, you can't serve before the king. Let's see what happened in the case of Ruth. Whether this was true of Ruth. 
whether she had a high throughput, the rate at which you succeed at whatever assignment you are given, the rate at which you or your company produce your, your process, your product, the rate at which you deliver the goods and the services that you offer. Sometimes you are in the customer service desk and inquiry in a sales organization, you are selling paint, you are selling whatever it is, and an inquiry comes, an email comes, and they are asking for inquiries, and you don't check it until three days after. You are always treating backlog of emails, emails of last week. You are yet to treat it today. You have a very low throughput, and your productivity is low. You cannot be enlisted in the king's service. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When an email comes through for you, it should be attended to on the go. Oh, give, acknowledge it. Oh, sin, we'll come back to you in a minute. We'll come back to you later. But for some of you, you will pile it up, and in the midst of it, some get lost. You don't even know what to do with it. You have a low throughput. Ruth, let's look at Ruth. Ruth chapter 2, from verse 5. Ruth had a very high throughput. Then Boaz said to his servant who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? So the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered and said, It is the young Moabite woman who came back with hopeless Naomi from the country of Moab. She was known in the land. And she said, who said? Ruth said, please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. Please let me glean. So she came and has continued from when? From morning until now. Though she rested a little in the house. Is that the way you walk? You come in the morning and you kick you get on it and you start walking. And you just take a little break. Your one hour break, you go for 30 minutes because you have nothing doing to stretch yourself and relax your muscles and your brain. And then you come back to continue to walk. Or you resume at 10 a.m. and then you have Nicodemusly gone out and you show up at 3 a.m. like a submarine. Hallelujah. You know, when a submarine is lowered into the sea, it's on the surface and it goes underground. Amen? And then appears at the other end. Is that the way you behave at work? Ruth engaged the assignment right from morning until evening. Just taking a little rest. <laughs> Glory to God. So she came, please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and has continued from morning until now, though she rested a little in the house. Let me take a few things. Let me show you a few things, and let's learn a few truths about Ruth. A few things here about Ruth. Number one, Ruth was not ashamed to go out and become a gleaner. She was not ashamed. She was the one that went to beg, please let me come and glean in your field. How is and why is that significant? Remember that the gleaners are the poor of the land or the strangers in the land who do not have a land of their own to farm on. That was established in the scriptures. Leviticus chapter 10. We've established that for you. Leviticus 10 verses 9 and 10. A gleaner is someone who is a stranger or the poor of the land. The foreigners, they have no access to land of their own. Leviticus chapter 19, chapter 19, verses 9 and 10. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest. What shall you do? You shall not glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather every grape of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. So she applied to become a gleaner. She was not ashamed. 
She was not ashamed of her state. She was not ashamed of her poverty. Remember, the famine chased them out of Jerusalem to go to Moab. And now, the father has died. The father-in-law has died. The husband of Naomi has died. Her two sons are dead. Now they are back empty with nothing. How will they feed? She was not ashamed to go out and become a gleaner. Hallelujah. Ruth begged to be allowed to walk. She begged to be allowed to serve. The force of determination is here being, being seen again. She activated that force. I said, you know what? I will not stay here hungry. Let me fend for my mother-in-law. She went out as a poor, identifying as a poor person or a stranger, who she was, to go and glean. Hallelujah. What's the significance of this for us? Some of us are so ashamed to ask for work. We are so ashamed to ask for work. Glory to God. You will rather be invited to come and help. Is someone here this morning? Many of you are so ashamed to ask for work, you will rather wait to be invited to come and help. That was in Ruth. It was in Ruth. What do I mean? Some of you will see your boss walking. You are by your desk. And your boss is somewhere. Is there busy walking, carrying this and carrying that. And then you pretend as if you are walking. Unless he invites you. Won't you join me? Can't you stand up and come and do this? You pretend as if you are walking. You are ashamed to ask for work. Hallelujah. And I see that happening in many fields. I see that happening. You feel so big and pompous. Say, I know, this is not my schedule. <laughs> Glory to God. I have my work schedule cut out for me. Thank God for your work schedule. Glory to God. Your benefits shall be according to your work schedule. You will not be invited to lunch with the prominent boas. Can I have an amen? You cannot activate the force of favor when that is your attitude. Ruth begged to be given work. She did not wait to be invited. She begged. She was not ashamed. Some of you, because of the tie and whatever you are putting on, you are so ashamed to do some work. You see some security men. When a guy is coming, they only open the gate. Even if he's carrying heavy load, they say, no, we are gate men. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Especially these uniform guards. Some of them can be so unproductive. I don't know whether that is their training. They don't do anything. They won't touch anything. Where they are staying, the compound can be as dirty as death. They will not carry and say, please, madam, can I have a broom to help you sweep? They say, no, we are security men. How many of you know what I'm talking about? That's what we are talking. Ruth was not ashamed to beg for work. She was not ashamed. She was not ashamed. Some of us, we know how to beg for allowance and please, can you help me do this? But you cannot beg for work. Hallelujah. Please, um, do you have some clothes to wash? I'm free after service. When have you ever done it? But you know how to come and beg. I don't have transport money to go back. Well, can you not go and say, yes, I was wondering whether you have some clothes that can help you wash at home. I'm free for this evening for three or four hours. How many of you have ever done that? But you are not ashamed to come and actually, you know, I came to church by faith, but I don't know how we go back. If you can help me, man. Hallelujah. Where is the Ruth spirit in you? You want to become distinguished. Be like Ruth and don't be ashamed to ask for work. She was not ashamed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He said, well, they know I'm available. They know I'm not working. If they want me to come and wash their car or their clothes, they can call me now. We come. Waiting to be invited. But when it's time to ask for money or to help, you don't wait. You are not ashamed of that. Glory to God. <laughs> Glory to God. Nobody is going to transfer knowledge or skills or technology to you just like that. You either acquire it by force or by subtlety. There's nothing like technology transfer. There's nothing like skill transfer. 
You're an employee in an office. You're a greenhorn out of the university, and you're waiting for them to come and show you work. You wait till kingdom come. You must not be ashamed. You must go for it. What can I help you to do? They say, oh, this is your immediate supervisor. You're an intern. And they say, this is your supervisor. Wait there and be waiting for them to come and give you work. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They will give you work. Go and make photocopy. Uh, go and photocopy this. Go and bind this report. Uh, go and, that's the work they will give you. If you think they will give you and show you how to address a case, you are wasting your time. You must go for it. You must go for it. Look at the spirit that Ruth had. She was not ashamed. But many of us, we are waiting to be invited. They've given you a glorified desk. They say, oh, this is your desk. That is the end. You are going to succeed on that assignment. You must learn and never be ashamed to ask for work. Please, what can I help you do? Oh, really, there's nothing. But you are doing something, sir. Can I help you to also do it? Oh, lawyer. They say, oh, which case are you working on, sir? Oh, well, no, I'm just trying to review my address. Uh, can I, what are the similar, which case? Ask for the case and go and look for several examples of that. It's called precedence. Get yourself busy and stop waiting. You must learn to ask and not be ashamed to ask for work. Glory to God. Nobody is going to transfer knowledge or skills or technology to you just like that. You either acquire it by force or by subtlety. But the easiest way, however, is the kingdom way, which is true service. That is the easy way, true service. When you stoop down to serve, when you stoop down to serve, you are helping them to do this, helping them to carry this, helping them to carry their cup, helping them to buy food. They will show you how it is done. Can I have an amen? amen? They will show you how it is done. The secret of the trade will be revealed to you. But you see there and say, you two, you are now a staff. Executive officer one. Wakwembe. Hallelujah. You will remain that executive officer for a long time. Glory to God. The second thing we see about Ruth is that Ruth was extremely hardworking. She was hardworking. So she came and has continued from morning until now, though she rested a little in the house. The New Living Translation of Ruth, chapter 2, verse 7, the B part says, the B part of the New Living Translation of that verse, she has been, she has been hard at work. NIV, NLT rather. She has been hard at work. Ever since. What is that? Help me now. Hard. She has been hard at work. What is that? Hard work. She has been hard at work ever since. Except a few minutes rest in the shelter. Whereas some of you are doing submarine. Hallelujah. She has been hard at work. Ruth was extremely hard working. She was extremely hardworking. Hallelujah. The message says, the message of the same verse 7, she has been at it steady ever since, from early morning until now, without so much as a break. She was extremely hardworking. You won't see her loitering around. You won't see her gossiping from table to table. You won't see her just... Busy budding all over the place. She has been at it, steady ever since, from early morning until now. Hallelujah. Ruth surely and definitely had a high throughput. She was highly productive, and the supervisor could not but notice her. Can I have an amen? Remember that there were many other young women. Boaz himself said it. He said, stay close to my young women but she was distinguished because she had a high throughput. Shout hallelujah. No, one, no wonder she became a candidate for the king's service. Boaz said, you know what? Don't go nowhere. Give me verse 8. Then Boaz said to Ruth, listen, my daughter, from now on, don't go to any other field to glean. 
Stay right here in this one and stay close to my young women. Which other woman was mentioned? She was the only one distinguished because she had a high throughput. Keep laying about at work. You want to become a world-class service provider? Not only must you be highly skilled, not only must you be spirit-filled, you must be a hard worker. Glory to God. Your skills are not enough. They are not enough. You must be a hard worker. You must be hard at work as well. Thank God for working smart. Thank God. Keep working smart and dodging work. <laughs> you will fail to be distinguished. Glory to God. I said, glory to God. Boaz said, stay close to my young women. The NIV, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field. Don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. He enlisted her and put a mark on her. She became distinguished because of her hard work. She, he only had the testimony of the supervisor. The supervisor said, this woman, since she came in since morning till now, she has been hard at work. She only left for a few minutes to rest. Glory to God. These are the triggers. You know, when a woman is determined to do what is right, to do what you have been called to do, to perform your assignment, whether anybody is looking or not, you trigger something in the realm of the spirit. She became distinguished. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What about for Daniel and his friends? Daniel and his friends activated the force of determination not to defile themselves with portions of the king's delicacies in Daniel 1.8. And when the results came out, like we read earlier, when the results will come out at the end of their conversion course at the Babylonian Presidential Service Academy, what happened? We are told, verse 18, now at the end of the days when the king has sold, has said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And verse 19 of Daniel 1, then the king interviewed them. Among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they served before the king because they were distinguished. Because they had a high throughput. It says none was found like them. They interviewed them, tested them, did CBT for them, computer-based testing, did oral interview. And even the king interviewed them and yet they were topping the class. Say, so yes, these ones qualify for the king's service. Jokers and mediocres have no place in the king's table. You have no place. There's no place for you. The Bible says we are kings and priests. But friend, in the company of kings and priests, is always the best. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 29. Proverbs 22, 29. Do you see a man who excels in his walk? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before unknown men. If you are going to qualify to stand before kings, you must be a man of excellence, a man that is highly productive, a man of a high throughput. Not the joker that wastes time. You think you are wasting other people's time, you are wasting your own life and destiny. It doesn't matter who is looking at you. It doesn't matter whether there's a CCTV camera in your office. It doesn't matter whether there's a supervisor over your head. When you get to work, engage yourself. Beg for work. Don't be ashamed. Be tired of sitting down doing nothing. Create work for yourself. Create work for yourself. Do you see a man who excels in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before unknown men. Give me, give me the NIV or the New Living Translation. New Living Translation. Do you see any truly competent workers? They will serve kings rather than working for ordinary people. Hallelujah. You must be a man of excellence. You must be a man that is highly skilled to be able to work for kings. Mediocres have no place in the king's service. Hallelujah. Message. 
the message, Proverbs 22, 29. Observe people who are good at their work. I love this. Are you good at your work? Or they are always complain. You do this, treat this file, respond to this mail. It's mistake upon mistake. Observe people who are good at their work. What happens to them? Skilled workers are always in demand and they are admired. Skilled workers. They are always in demand and they are admired. They don't take a back seat to anyone. You will not take a back seat. You will not remain a backseater. In the name of Jesus. Our slogan is highly skilled, spirit-filled, innovative, world-class service providers. And you observe people that are good at their work, skilled workers. They're always in demand and admired. They don't take a back seat to anyone. Hallelujah. Listen, friends, there is something about work and competence that the world has mastered which the church is still struggling with. There is something about work and competence. There is something about work and competence. The world has mastered it, but the church is still struggling. Can I have an amen? All hiding behind faith, hiding behind prayer, hiding behind kabash. You think everything is kabash? Whereas the world has mastered something. There is something about work and competence. The world has mastered it. They may not be able to speak in even one tongue as you do. But you have majored in the minors and minored in the major. Can I have an amen? Your skill must be there then the spirit will energize it. Can I have an amen? Can I have an amen? Can I have an amen? amen. It's been a while. Let me perform a short quiz this morning. Can I have two of you jump forward? Yeah, you, bro. Yeah, the two of you come. It's been a while. Let me do a short quiz. Hallelujah. Who is worth, who is work among you and who is faith? Are you a man of faith? You are a man of work. You want to be work. So you want to faith. Okay, it's faith and it's work. Give me James chapter 2. James chapter 2. Verse 20. Okay, go down. No, just give me James 2. New King James. Verse 26. Hallelujah. New King James. Yes. Okay. This is Mr. Faith. And this is Mr. Works. Okay. Maybe I need two more people. As the body. Without the spirit. Just wait a minute. As the body without the spirit is dead. So faith without works is dead. Okay. Can I have two more folks? Two more folks. Brother, two. one more person. Yeah, you come. Okay. So, who is body and who is spirit? Your yeah, spirit. <laughs> Indeed, is a man of the spirit. Okay, so your spirit, and then this is faith. Equation no work. And you are body. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. So let me take the guys in front. You are spirit and your body. As the body without the spirit. Okay, this is Mr. Body, right? Okay, body is here. Eh? And then this is Mr. Spirit. Where is faith? Faith is here. Okay, come here. Eh, come here. Okay, come here. Come here. Come here. Yes. Okay, as the body is without the spirit, so is faith without works. Faith without works. Body without spirit. Okay, so which one is spirit? Or which one is spiritual? Is it body, is it works of faith? Let me not confuse you with this. Between faith and works, which one is spirit? 
faith. Come on, don't confuse me. Don't confuse me. Between faith and works, which one is spiritual? Huh? Between faith and works, which one is spiritual? Faith. If you say faith, raise up your hand. Stand up on your feet. You are the ones that pass now. Yeah, stand up, stand up, stand up. Hallelujah. Please sit down. If you say works, let me see your hand up. Ah, oh, you have little faith. Only few people. Ah, hallelujah. So let's see who the winner is. Let's see who the winner is. So there are more, you people say faith is more spiritual, right? Than works. As the body without the spirit. Okay. Body without the spirit is dead. So faith without works is dead also. Right? The body without the spirit is dead. Is it? Isn't it so? When somebody dies, the body is there, but the spirit has gone. So body without spirit is faith without works is so which one is equivalent to spirit? Is it faith or works? Hallelujah. So those of you that said faith is the spiritual, are you correct? Odo, Olojueja. Hallelujah. Please go back to your seat. I almost forgot that my illustration. Everywhere I have gone, I haven't carried out that illustration in number of in England, in US that have preached and ministered, they always get it wrong. And the pastors, I have to come and talk and say, how come is it? I say, it's scriptures. The body without the spirit is dead. So also faith without works is dead. It is your work that energizes your faith. It is your work that is the spirit that is driving your faith. <laughs> Hallelujah. Don't be confused. It's simple. Faith cannot exist. It's nothing without works. But works can exist without faith. That's why unbelievers have works. They may not have faith, but they get results. And you, with your faith and no work, you remain poor. You remain on the ground because there is no work to exercise your faith. And that's the difference. That's the point. We kabash and pray and confess and do all manner of things instead of doing the real thing that will produce the results. The body without the spirit is dead. Faith without works is dead also. It is your works that energizes your faith. Your faith is nothing without your works. It's nothing. And exercise faith from now till tomorrow. Without works, it is dead. Hallelujah. Let's put our hands together for Jesus. Glory to God. Let me tell your neighbor, step up. Step up. In your faith walk, step up. Hallelujah. So I did say that there is something about work and competence that the world has mastered, which the church is still struggling with. And the earlier we come to terms with them, the better we become positioned to fulfill God's purposes and also to meet the aspirations of the world. Romans 8, 19, the earnest expectation of the creature is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. The world understands something about work and competence. Whereas the church, we are still struggling. We believe all is faith. Everything is prayer. We pray. You have interview. Instead of you to prepare all night and check out videos, check out TED Talk, check out, do a research on that organization you are going to be interviewed. Know what they do. Know their MD. Know their chairman. Know the year the company was started. Know their core values. Know their mission. Know their vision. Know everything and master everything about them and be ready to lecture them with it. You are praying all night. Did I say prayer is not good? Prayer is good, but do the works first. Then support and back it up with prayer. Hallelujah. You get to a place, they ask you some dangerous questions that you, you, you are trying to fumble. Then you begin to talk to them. But I thought your vision is so, so, and so. I thought your mission is to do this. I have an understanding of what you do. They would look at themselves and think twice. This one is knowledgeable. But you get there, they ask you something you don't know. They ask, you have nothing to say. You have prayed all night. What is the essence of the prayer? 
Hallelujah. You are coming to an organization, you don't know anything about them, and you have prayed up. You have even fasted for three days and three nights. And then you get to the interview place carrying the anointing. And they ask you a simple thing about what do you think we do here? And you are scratching. <laughs> Actually, um, you know, my uncle referred me. He gave me a note to come and meet your MD. Is that the question they're asking you? Hallelujah. Glory to God. There is something about work and competence that the world has mastered, which the church is still struggling with. Let's go with me to Genesis 47. Let me establish that point for us. Genesis 47 from verse 1. You know the story of Joseph and his brothers in Egypt. Joseph was in Egypt. His brother, the brothers and father was in, they were in Canaan. Famine came upon the entire world, a famine that was orchestrated by God himself. And of course, Joseph had become the prime minister. He has given Egypt the joker to solve their food supply problems. He created the first integrated food storage program in history. Genesis 47 from verse 1. Then Joseph went and told Pharaoh and said, My father, my brothers, their flocks and their herds and all that they possess have come from the land of Canaan. Indeed, they are in the land of Goshen. He took five men from among his brothers and presented them to Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh said to his brothers, What is your... What is your... And they said to Pharaoh, your servants are shepherds, both we and also our fathers. The world is interested in your occupation. They are not interested in your tongues. Show them your occupation first. That's what the world is interested in. Hallelujah. What is your business pursuit? The king was asking them. Now, what is your business pursuit? What is your enterprise? What is your trade? What can you do? That's what the world is interested in. And that's why early missionaries, that's what they do. They learn a trade, go to a country as a professional, as a missionary, as a teacher, as a medical doctor, because the world is interested in that first and foremost. And when you get there, you can then begin to infiltrate through your service. You can begin to show them that your work is a form of worship. Hallelujah. Amen. Walk was Adam's worship in the beginning. There he will serve. He will, God put him in the garden to dress it and to keep it. And God will come back in the evening, in the cool of the day, to find out, hey, son, how are you doing? How was work today? That was fellowship between Adam and God. Glory to God. That was fellowship. To find out about the work, the assignment he had given him. Occupation means. Occupation is defined as a principal activity in your life that you do for livelihood. The principal activity you do in your life that you do for livelihood. That is what occupation means. It's the Hebrew word masay. Occupation, what you do, your business pursuit, your enterprise, your work. And let me point out the difference between occupation and vocation. How many of you know the difference between occupation and vocation? It is usually sometimes interchangeably used, but not exactly. A slight difference. Occupation, according to Merriam Webster's English dictionary, is defined as a summon. A summons or strong inclination to a particular course of action. A summon, that is the operative word. A call. Vocation, vo vox, is from call, is a call. That to me is the major difference. It also defines vocation as a divine call to the religious life or an entry into the priesthood or a religious order. But please take note, the operative word there is call. Call. So vocation is used for a calling into, a spiritual, into the spiritual life or religious order. An entry into the priesthood. So we say, what is your vocation? 
By vocation, we are all believers. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. The Bible tells us, Ephesians, give me Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Walk worthy of the vocation wherein you have been called. We all have a vocation. Glory to God. Again, Miriam Webster defines it as the walk, talking of vocation, in which a person is regularly employed. The person is engaged in a particular occupation. So you see, that it begins to fade out and it's almost like occupation. But friends, the operative word there is a call. However, your occupation can become your vocation. Can I have an amen? Your occupation can become your vocation. Number one, when you take your business, your enterprise, your career, your trade as a divine call and use it as a vehicle for being a blessing to all the families of the earth. So your vocation becomes, your occupation becomes a vocation. Hallelujah. Your occupation can become a vocation. When you take your business or your enterprise or your career or your trade, you see it as a vehicle. You see it as a divine calling. And you want to use it as a vehicle to be a blessing to all the families of the earth. According to the Abrahamic call, Genesis chapter 12 verse 3. When you see your occupation from that perspective as a call, you are a doctor, you see yourself as a, on a call, a divine call to save lives, a divine call to be a blessing to all the families of the earth. As a medical doctor, you see it as a nurse, as an engineer. You see your, your work as a calling. You are working in the waterworks. You want to be a blessing to everyone. You are a motor mechanic. You see your work as a divine calling to ensure that every vehicle that comes into your shed, the owner lives happy and is not complaining and cursing you. Because some folks carry their vehicle to the mechanic. They go with one problem and live with four. And the moment they are discovering something that was not there before, they are sending a curse back to you. But somebody comes there, he spends the lowest amount of money he has ever spent, and yet he goes there and his car is perfectly working. He will forever be blessing you. That is a mechanic who has taken his occupation as a vocation, as a divine calling, not as an avenue to milk and shave people's head, but as a calling to be a blessing to the families of the earth. Hallelujah. So that's when your occupation becomes your vocation. You see your work as a divine calling to be a blessing to all the families of the earth. Secondly, your occupation can become a vocation when you take your business, your career, and your trade, and your enterprise as a means for establishing the kingdom of God and promoting the expansion of his kingdom right here on earth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Luke 5, Peter offered his boat for the master. Even though he had toiled all right and caught nothing. But what happened at the end of the day? Because God is not a taskmaster. Hallelujah. He says, launch out into the deep. And they caught a great catch. Hallelujah. That is when, again, your occupation can become your vocation. When you release your enterprise, your boat, your trade, your work, you release it and use it as a means for furthering the expansion of the gospel. And establishing the kingdom of God. Matthew chapter 6 verse 10. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Shout hallelujah. The world understands that work is a form of worship. Though they have replaced God with it and are now worshiping their work. It was not so in the beginning. Hallelujah. They understand the place of work. Though they have pushed, some have pushed it too far. That is why some, their work is their God. They worship their work. They elevate their work above every other thing. But it wasn't so in the beginning. It wasn't so. Hallelujah. Whereas in the beginning, it was meant to be a platform of worship. That is, our work ought to be a platform for service as a form of worshiping God. That's who we believers ought to be. You see your work as a form, a platform of service. A platform of service so that God can be glorified. A platform for service as a form of worshiping God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
where we serve our customers as a form of worship, where we deliver products and services that will bring gladness to men's hearts and cause them to remember the God that is in us. Glory to God. You offer service, customer service to people. They never want to have any other clients. They keep coming back. They keep coming back. They keep coming back. Why? Because you have served them as unto the Lord. Glory to God. I say glory to God. Very quickly, Habakkuk chapter 1. Habakkuk chapter 1. Just go straight to verse 14. I would have loved to read, okay, from verse 12. Lord, are you not from everlasting, my God, my Holy One? NIV, Habakkuk 1, NIV. Let's read from verse 12. Are you not from everlasting, my God, my Holy One? You will never die. You, Lord, have appointed them to execute judgment. You, my rock, have ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent when the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? You know, sometimes we, have those, we, we ask those questions. Why does the evil people, why do they prevail over us as children of God? Even though your eyes are too pure than to behold evil. Verse 14. You have made people like the fish in the sea, like the sea creatures that have no ruler. The wicked folk pulls all of them up with hooks. He catches them in his net. Peter had a boat and also had his net and drag net that they used to catch fish. He catches them in his net. He gathers them up in his drag net, fishing tools, implements of your service, of your work. And so he rejoices and is glad. But look at verse 16. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net and burns incense to his. His work has become his God. That's what happens to the wicked. They sacrifice, they are now worshipping their net, burning incense to their dragnet. For by his net, he lives in luxury, isn't it? Is it not the work that is making all the money and the millions and the private jet for him? So that's why he's worshipping it. Work, instead of it being a form of worship, has they've replaced worship with God. They're now worshiping their work. By his net, he lives in luxury and enjoys the choicest food. Glory to God. How did we get here? I'm saying the world understands something about work and competence, but they have perverted it. But we don't even have a clue at all. We serve in church, holy hands, blessing God, praising him. But when we get to the marketplace, we are jokers, non-entities and mediocres. Whereas they understand the place of competence and work. Though they have pushed it beyond their boundary. Jeremiah chapter 16, quickly. Jeremiah 16. Jeremiah 16, let's quickly read from verse 14. However, the days are coming declares the Lord, when it will no longer be said, NIV, thank you, as surely as the Lord lives, who brought the Israelites up out of Egypt? But it will be said, as surely as the Lord lives, who brought the Israelites up out of the land of the north and out of all the countries where he had banished them, for I will restore them to the land I gave their ancestors. Yes, he will. How will he do it? How will he do it? Because of sin, because of iniquity. He had banished them to other lands. He says, I will bring them back. How will he do it? Now I will send for many fishers. The, new, the King James says, I will send for many fishers. Or fishermen, declares the Lord. And they will catch them. Can I have an amen? Can I have an amen? Does God intend us to use our nets and our workplaces to be areas for catching men and saving men? Oh, yes. And after that, I will send for many hunters. They will hunt them down on every mountain and hill and from the crevices of the rocks. Hallelujah. Even though contextually he was talking about the fact that there is no hiding place. My eyes are on all their ways. They are not hidden from me, nor is their sin concealed from my eyes. 
and yet I will repay them double for their wickedness and their sin because they have defiled my land with the lifeless forms of their vile images and have filled my inheritance with their detestable idols. God was saying he can use, he can use our working place to fish out the sinners. Hallelujah. And bring them into a place of salvation. He says, follow me, he said to his disciples in Matthew 4, and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me, and I will make you hunters of men. Follow me, and I will make you drivers of men. Follow me, and I will make you nurses of men. Follow me, and I will make you doctors of men. He wants you to use your profession and your platform as a lawyer. Lawyer them into my kingdom. Can I have an amen? A platform, I walk ought to be a platform of worship, saving souls and bringing men into his kingdom. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. You must ensure that your enterprise and profession becomes an avenue to hunt down sinners from every mountain and to fish them out and catch them for the Lord. Shout hallelujah. Well, as I begin to round up, let's go back to Genesis, Genesis 47 that we are reading. We just took a brief detour to talk about occupation and vocation. We're reading Genesis 47 about Pharaoh. So Pharaoh said to his brothers, what is your occupation? And they said to Pharaoh, your servants are shepherds, both we and also our fathers. And look at verse 4. And they said to Pharaoh, we have come to dwell in the land because your servants have no pasture for their flocks. For the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. Now, therefore, let your servants dwell in the land of Goshen. Next verse. It's getting interesting. Then Pharaoh spoke to Joseph, saying, Your father and brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is before you. Have, have your father and brothers dwell where? In the best of the land. Favor can bring you to live in the best of the land. You can enjoy the best of the land, but there's a higher level. Let them dwell in the land of Goshen. Look at the next phrase. And if you know any competent men among them, then make them chief hearts men over my livestock. You cannot serve in the king's palace, in the king's executive. If you are not competent, the world understands this more than the church. Live in the best of the land is a privilege you have. But for you to be able to serve in the king's executive, look for the most competent among them to be my chief headsman. Hallelujah. If you know any competent among them, then make them my chief herds men over my flocks. The NIV says, let them live in Goshen. NIV, if you know any among them with special ability, highly skilled, put them in charge of my own livestock. If you are going to serve before the king, you must become highly skilled. You must become competent. You must have special abilities. Hallelujah. You must become a man of competence and a man of means. The message is men that are especially good at their work. Men with special skills. Hallelujah. This is what the world has master. This is Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. He first asked, what is your occupation? And now he's saying, for them to serve before me, they must be competent men. Are you competent? Do you have the special skills? Do you have the special abilities? Are you especially good at your work? That is what is required in the days ahead. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Let's rise up on our feet. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, Father, we are grateful to you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We bless you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just thank him and appreciate him. And ask him to help you 
to become highly skilled, to develop special abilities, to develop the special abilities of God upon your life. Just ask him, talk to him this morning and appreciate him. Talk to him and say, Lord, help me to hone my skills, to hone my abilities. Yes, Lord, help me to become especially good at my work. Help me, Lord, to develop the special skills you have put in my life. In the name of Jesus, lift your voice and talk to him. Zentarabo shikaturia bazata. La rapo zendi ma zandarabo shikato. Raka papa zegato to praka zegato die. Raku pa zendi ma shandaria. Reka po si padria papa shikata. Talk to God. Talk to Him. He is your God. Yes, He doesn't want us to be jokers or non-entities. No, He doesn't want us to. He doesn't want us to be jokers or mediocres. He wants us to be competent, really competent. He wants us to have special abilities. He wants us to hone our skills and to become especially good at our work. Zendarabo shikaturia bazata. Karia pasa pro papa shikaturia bazata. Oh, ma zendaraba base prako shikaturia. Thank you, Lord. Just talk to him, friends. Talk to him. Talk to him this morning. Yes, God, there is something about work and competence. You must become a master in your field. You must develop your special abilities. You must become a man that is highly skilled. And then coupled with the Spirit of God upon you, you can you become an innovative, world-class service provider. Yes, 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 yes. Activating the force of determination will propel you to serve in the king's palace, before the king, in the king's service. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name mighty name we have prayed. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. May the dormant giftings on your inside be awakened. May the Lord stir up his giftings in your life. May your skills become developed. In the name of Jesus, every dormant ability in you, I call them forth. In the name of Jesus, I ask that the Spirit of God may come upon you and stir up the giftings of God on your inside in the name of Jesus. You will no longer be a mediocre. You will no longer be a joker. You will be a world-class service provider. You will become an innovative world-class service provider. The creativity juice of God on your inside will be awakened in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed.